You're listening to the Antos Podcast, where we explore the natures of stories and the pursuit of being in truth. I'm Bud. And I'm Mac. And our sentience depends on you. Now cue the intro music. All right, so we are in chapter one and potentially two. We'll probably do two as well. Yeah, we'll kind of get a feel for this, and but I, I think chapter one and two both kind of lay the foundation for the groundworks for our point of view characters, and so I think it would be best to do them both together. Let's get it taken care of. All right, let's go into chapter one then. So we are introduced to Vin, uh, a small ska girl who um, she mentions is abandoned by her older brother and is kind of just stuck in this thiev- thieving crew uh, run by a, name, a man by the name Cayman. And she stuck there because her brother abandoned her and left her with his debt. And at this point, she doesn't know what she could possibly do. And she owes Cayman whatever this debt is. And so she works for him. And we're kind of like introduced to her while she's solo. She seems to be kind of afraid, trying to stay away from the other crew members, trying to keep to herself and very solitary. Until one of the crew members by the name of Yulith comes and grabs her and tells her that the, the, the crew is the crew leader came and is looking for her. And man, we're introduced to a very abusive relationship very quickly. Vin shows up and with any sort of little defiance, you know, all the way up to just showing up a little late, came and smacks her just and we we see very quickly what kind of guy came in is. He seems to be super nervous because they're pulling a job. And Vin notices that his abuse comes from his nervousness in the sense that he's worried because they are looking to scam the nobles and an obligator. This is a very different view of the ska that we had compared to the the plantation ska in the prologue. They're aggressive. You know, they're like... The, the plantation ska seem to be completely beaten down and broken, not a ounce of rebellion in their body here. Yet the thieving crews here in Luthadel, they are ambitious. This this crew leader is trying to scam an obligator, which we saw the importance of in the prologue with the way a nobleman and Lord Trusting, the way he treated one. So uh you can kind of get the sense, and I don't know about other people, I got a little tension here just in the little bit I knew. You know, we're getting introduced to this guy who's trying to scam an obligator. Well, Cayman decides he's really nervous. Vin is kind of pointing out some inconsistencies in their scam. Um, Cayman's trying to play the, the, the part of a a lord who is in desperate need, his house is in financial ruin, and the only way that he can save it is to basically give the steel ministry, the people where the obligators work, or the place where the obligators work, uh, a deal they can't refuse, a deal so good, and I want to say it's like they were talking about transporting goods up canals. Um, People, I think. uh, Yeah, 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 bringing down the steel ministry's uh, acolytes. Acolytes, Acolytes, yeah. yeah. And so he's trying to offer them a deal they can't refuse, essentially, and he's going to take the money, cut, and run. Well, the big important thing we learned here is he's working with another crew leader. And this other crew leader basically laid down the found the groundwork and the foundation for this scam by paying off the right people, developing the right connections for transporting goods via canal. Correction. It was a little, it was a little bit different what the plan was going to be. So what the plan, I think, was initially was that, that crew leader who set things up was they were going to get the contract to transport these people, and they learned that there was ATM or something else that was going with them, a bunch of money that would follow them at the same time, and they were going to raid their own ship and yeah, take yeah. all of that, and then they were going to be like, oh, well, I guess we got robbed, uh, you yeah, know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, with this foundation laid, Vin started poking some holes in it, though. Vin started mentioning, at least with, with when in regards to, to Cayman, you know, hey, your servants, you know, they're not good enough, you know. They're they're too rich. Yeah, I mean, I know. Was it that they were? Yeah, too yeah. Rich? He was saying she was saying like, 
oh, um, you're you're supposed to be an impoverished, desperate nobleman. Yeah, they looked and, too good. And you're yeah. got and you have these like really really wealthy people. Like if you go in with this, you're not going to look like you're desperate. You're going to look like you're trying to scam someone. Yeah. Well, in this moment, Cayman decides he's going to get a bit angry and he's going to smack her again. And Vin decides to use her luck. Whatever it is, Cayman suddenly kind of calms down, lets it go, and listens to Vin, and kind of takes her advice and corrects some things that she pointed out, but not everything. Well, regardless, the obligator shows up and is ready to make this deal. The obligator kind of sniffs it out. This deal is a little too good to be true, and you can get the sense that he's he's picking up, like, he might not know it's a scam, but he knows that there's something that, 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 that there's something to be worried about here. Right. He's like, I, I'm already like going to refuse this, but they already know if he was really going to refuse him, he wouldn't show up in the first place. Exactly. And so with that understanding, Cayman kind of pushes it, offers an even better deal than that they were going to give originally. And Vin once again uses her luck. And it's kind of described as Vin just focuses on the obligator and the obligator goes from being suspicious to being relaxed and calm and she even has moments where she lets go of the luck and you can see he almost instantly goes back to being suspicious and then she do, does it again and she eventually gets to the point where this obligator decides this is a good enough deal that i'm going to take it back to my council in the ministry and we're going to discuss it we're not going to just abandon you and that is where we, we, we're ending with chapter one. A, a relatively short chapter, but man, it is packed with stuff to break down. So let's go ahead and do that before we start discussing chapter two. So, uh, you know, we obviously, we get back with the obligators. We get introduced with, you know, Vin is one of the ska. And you, like you said, like these ska, like clearly are, you know, they're not like hopeful, you know, people, but they are like trying to make their way through the world in the only way they know how to. And Vin is at least showing some level of competence here by being like, hey, you know, I'm part of this plan, but you did you really think this through? And then you got Cayman who's just, you know, lashes out at every little thing. And he's just like, he, he, I don't want to say he's losing his mind, but He's clearly an anxious guy. He's just super nervous. This is, uh, like, I think it's mentioned somewhere that this is an even bigger scam than he's normally pulled. Yeah, they say, like, you know, the they they would be getting tens of thousands or, like, thousands, at least, of, of boxings, which are the currency here for this one job. And they would only get, like, maybe a few hundred out of typical, you know, jobs that they would do. So it's a, it's a big deal, you know, that they're going to go through with all this. Um and you know he's taking Vin along, and uh, you know she's in the position of having to essentially cover for the debts that her brother left when he went by he, when he left, and uh, you know crappy position for her to be in. Um, but she also mentions you know her brother Reen. Uh, she mentions like how he taught her to be you know where she was. Uh, she taught her to be, taught her to be ruthless and to basically assume everyone's always going to betray you. Um, and it mentions, I think she's only about 16 years old. Yeah. She was, uh, I want to say she was 16 when he left or yeah, may, and that may be accurate. I thought, I thought she might be 16 now, but, but she's young. She's she is quite young, you yeah. know, she's really young and um, you know, she's gotten, you know, everything tells her that there's no one to trust now uh, that there's, you know, everyone's going to betray you. Everything. Yeah. You've got to be terrible person all the time. Yeah. She, she consistently hears her brother's voice in the back of her mind telling her like every time that she could possibly let her guard down with anything. It's just that voice is always in the back of the head. Like, you know, they'll betray you, whatever it is, you know, like why would they help you? What, you know, whatever the voice is saying, it's always pointing. It's Reen's voice saying, listen, remember what I taught you. Um, everything's terrible. Yeah. Including me. Yeah. And it, it, I think she even says like, he even told me that he was going to, he was going to abandon me or he's going to betray me. And then he did. Um, so, I mean, you got this, you know, you got this, still this idea of like, she's the same thing with the ska. She's beaten down. Uh, but she's beaten down in a more per she's at, at a personal level you know she's got ingrained in her head constantly running through that 
you know, you have to be ruthless. You have to be terrible. You have to be a bad person. And guess what? Everyone else, they're also bad people. They're, they're all terrible. And I mean, we're not seeing any proof otherwise in this chapter, at least that, uh, anyone is, uh, you know, going to be helping her out in any, any, any one way. I mean, yeah, she showed up and the first thing this dude does is smack her. Yes. It's like, yeah. And so, um, why don't we go ahead and go kind of go start cruising into chapter two? Yeah, this one, this chapter is relatively short. It was a good mm-hmm. introduction. Um, you know, we get the assumption again that Vin's probably going to be another point of view character that we're going to follow for a little while here. But moving into chapter two, we get the arrival of Kelsier in Lufado, and man, we get an absolutely like beautiful description of the sprawling city. It's nothing like the plantations. It's I don't want to say it has like a modern feel to it, but it has like an early Victorian kind of feel to it in terms of its description here. And we get a, a big description of Credic Shaw, which ends up being the Lord Ruler's palace that's just uh, twice as large as everything else in this city. I want to say that they described it as being a hill of a thousand spires. The house of a thousand spires. spires yeah. And it's just kind of incredible. Well, we get Kelser meets up with well, one thing I kind of want to go through, like before we get out, is like the big description of this city um, is is you know the their black stained buildings, black streets, a red sun and a darkened sky, ash everywhere that has to be constantly cleared out. So again, we're getting back to this environment, to this really, really, really dark, you know, overcast area, um, really dreary, dreary place to go into. Yeah, and like you know, at this point, like. We've gotten very, very big mentions of the ash. Like, where is this ash coming from? It's just falling out of the sky. Right. And a pretty gloomy place. Like, I think of, like, like early Victorian England when it was hitting the industrial industrial stage. Everything's covered in soot yeah. kind of thing. Just absolutely disgusting place to live. And whose job is, is it to clean up? The ska. The, the ska, mm. yep. Well, Kelsier meets up with the first member of his crew. And, oh, I... Gotta love Kelsier's crew. But here we go. We get our first introduction to the first crew member, Doxon. And Doxon talks about um, needing a plan again, or needing some sort of plan of getting the crew back together. Kelsier wants to pull them all back together for something. And he kind of kind of talks about how they're gonna they're gonna figure that out. And then wonders how the heck Kelsier got in, you know? He goes, I have people watching every entry into the city for you. How did you get in? And Kelsier kind of gives him the look and the nod and and Doxon's like oh yeah that I you know I can't you know I need to remember now that you're different than the last time we met right and kind of gives that nod to like okay you know we kind of saw it in the prologue but what exactly is Is different Kelsier Kelsier. you know (laughs) yeah well he he's taking Doxon notes that he's going to take some getting used to to uh this new ability and that Breeze and Hammond are mentioned. Breeze and Ham. As, you know, other potential crew members that they need to pull back together. That's our first kind of introduction to them. And uh, they mention that they're someone that they that they call a smoker. That they're their original smoker is dead. And so that they're going to need to find a new one. Uh, they mention the, this guy by the name of Clubs, who essentially has a nephew that's a ten-eye. And we're starting to get these descriptions of what's a smoker, what's a ten eye, like what are all these different titles that these people hold in the in the criminal underworld. And Doxon and Kelser just both seem as giddy as children to be working a job together again. They're both so happy. Doxon is excited to see Kelser. It's been, according to them, it's been a while. Mm-hmm. Um, they've been wondering kind of what kelsier has been up to up to this point, but. Uh, I think they mentioned like three or four years, something like that. Yeah. Yeah, I probably. It's been, it was a while. Right. Um, but then we began to get that bit of a view and we are launched back to Cayman and Vin as a point of view here with Vin being our point of view character. And Cayman is going off script. Vin's trying to figure out what the heck's going on because Cayman is willingly taking her and a couple of other servants to the steel ministry. Just going right into just walking in, and Vin Vin is surrounded very, by all the enemies. <laughs> yeah, Vin is very adamant in her own mind here, going like, 
this is the same guy who was anxious to have an obligator in the same room as him, yet he's walking into Obligator Central, Mm -hmm. walking into the lion's den, and she cannot figure out why. She's starting to try to put it all together. We we learned very quickly that Vin is a very observant and very smart character. She is like starting to run the calculations in her brain. Why would this be happening? And Cayman decides that he wants to meet one-on-one with the previous obligator because he wants to betray the other crew leader. Right. In his mind, he said, why do all of that when we could get a down payment to get our boats running and then just run? And the other crew leader is going to be left, left with hanging. the aftermath uh, of see, what's going to happen. And the other guy was like his rival or something like that. Yeah. And Vin, Vin after kind of having this pointed out, she asks, came in and came in amidst to it. And Vin immediately goes, well, that makes sense. You know, everyone betrays everyone. That ring, her brother's voice in her head, everyone betrays everyone. Mm-hmm. And she was starting to wonder that, you know, came and must have seen this coming. She, he, that the other crew leader probably was going to betray him. Mm-hmm. And so they try to get a one-on-one. And that obligator's not there that day. And instead, they're introduced to a high pralin, which is like the boss, the boss of the obligators, one of the bosses. And oh boy, Vin's alarms start going off. We, uh, you know, Cayman's pretending to be the small, decrepit house. Why is there a high pralin talking to him? Mm-hmm. And Vin is so nervous. Something is just eating at her that something's going wrong. Well, the Praelin basically asks Cayman to convince him to why this occurs, and Cayman does a terrible job. Well, a terrible job. He I just mean, kept saying, I mean, he he does a job. He does basically what he did before, he, but he kept saying, I'm not convinced. You could do better than that. Yeah. I mean, I say he does a terrible job because he gave a pitch to someone you'd give as an intro pitch. It's like mm-hmm. the idea of, that's a pitch that, I would give you in a room trying to get you to get on board with something. That's not a pitch I'd give as like a business pitch, right? And so in that case, I think he does a terrible job. Sure. And I mean, it doesn't work. And I mean, I mean yeah, the, the, the high prelim goes, basically just keeps egging him on. Convince me, convince me. Well, what finally gets him to shut up is Vin to the rescue. Vin uses her luck and tries to calm him down, make him less suspicious. But then almost immediately... The high praline goes, you've convinced me. And Vin's alarms go freaking crazy at that point. She had just used her luck, and suddenly everything turned out. This guy was convinced quicker with the use of her luck than the the, the grunt obligator. Mm-hmm. And he hands over 3,000 boxings to Cayman. Cayman's as giddy as can be and leaves. Everything is going exactly to plan. They walk out. Bam. We cut but, back to but they, but they had said the obligator was super happy, and mm-hmm. they said whenever there's a happy obligator, you're in trouble. Yeah, yep. Yeah. <laughs> well, we cut right back to Dachshund and Kelsier's point of view. They've been watching them. They were standing outside the miser- the ministry, and they are watching came and leave with Finn. Dachshund's mentioning how Kelsier's brother Marsh, um, came and tried to scam Marsh. You know. And how basically Marsh told Doxon, hey, keep an eye on the girl. The girl's special. And so there they are waiting. And as they both expect, came in and Vin leave. And not less than a minute later, the High Pralin comes walking out with the Steel Inquisitor ready to follow them. Now, the Steel Inquisitor, man, <laughs> scary. Uh, mm-hmm. Kelsier, they give the brief description. This is a something that Kelsier, is, you know, describes as superhuman. It is a thing, a person or a thing, with two gigantic spikes pushed through their eye sockets and coming out the back of their skulls. It's basically like big railroad spikes coming through. Oh through, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Bigger actually by the description, it sounds like. But yeah, I mean long, long too. It goes right. clean through the socket. And out the back of the head. Right. This is a monstrosity. Um, that's no, there's no better way to put it. And both Dachshund and Kelsier are shaken. And, I mean, this is the confident Kelsier. This is the guy who killed an entire plantation, plantation of guards. yeah. And even he is a bit shaken. Well, that doesn't last for long, though. 
Kelsier tells Doxen, hey, go get rid of the tails. We don't need them following Vin and Cayman. He doesn't give them by name, but he, we don't need him, them being followed. And we are left and ended in this chapter with Kelsier again burning some sort of metal, as he says it. And he says he pulls on the Steel Inquisitor. Something He does something, and the Steel Inquisitor turns and looks at him. And Kelsier says, time for you to give you a little bit of a chase. And that is where we're left at the end of chapter two. So again, I mean, you know, so many different things. We get introduced to a Steel Inquisitor. I Which, mean, since we already left there. Dude, Steel Inquisitors, terrifying. I mean, just from that description. It, like, it, they're only mentioned a couple times beforehand, you know, before they get, you see one. And yeah, I mean, you got this this guy you know since you walk around with these metal spikes going through his face you know coming out the back of his head um yeah why aren't you dead and they're you know not not as dead but like you already know that that, that didn't kill him so there's got to be some level of power something else going on the, here the thing that made it even creepier is like it is specifically stated that whatever kelser did it sensed it, it. it well it looked at him the right. spikes faced him. It looked at him. Right, like he was like, well, I don't know. If he looked at him, but he looked to his general direction. It was like he, yeah. he, he, it got his attention, and he was like, okay, now we got to get him going. Um, and you know, we got this idea that that the, the um, obligator was baiting them. You know, they was looking for something. He was looking for something the yeah. whole time. I mean, I mean, I mean, he, he was like, come on, come on. Come on, you could do better. So, so yeah, the high, the high Praelin. Yeah, 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 the high Praelin. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Originally, I you know, I'm still curious about it. You know, did like you mentioned, like you said, did the obligator bait them too? Because like, the obligator is the one that brought the proposal, but suddenly the obligator was conveniently gone, and there was a high pra- Praelin waiting for them. Right, and I mean, it, it does imply, you know. They, they they were suspicious of them for something. Yeah, yeah. For but sure. when did it happen? Uh that's difficult to say. Um I mean But Vin's doing something. Something's happening with her. Like I know. she's got something going on. Yeah, and I if the ministry must know about it, at least to some extent, because they're even smart enough to say, Hey, you're only allowed to bring one other person in. So they I, it feels like they had it nailed that it wasn't Cayman, but like whatever was going on they were sitting there because they specifically they said, "Hey, you're allowed to bring one person in." Came and was visibly annoyed as hell, and then picked Vin, right? Mm-hmm. And he, like you said, the way the high Praline, like we we all got a sense, you know, we didn't need. I know, I think most readers, most listeners, whatever it is, didn't need, you know, Vin's like inner monologue, Alarm bells. yeah, <laughs> yeah, that were basically blaring through the roof that something was wrong. With this guy basically going, you can do better. Well, I mean, you can do better. You know, the, and, and Brandon uh, abandoned the subtlety here with saying, like, there's something going on. Just keep an eye mm-hmm. out. You know, so we didn't even need to say that. We did. You could just say, oh, you know, clearly something else going on here. Um, but we mentioned that Marsh, you know, knew about her, you know, yeah, well how, ahead of time. Yeah. How did Marsh know? So she's clearly got a little bit of reputation. There's something going on with her, you know. Uh, or at least their thieving crew or something. So did the first obligator suspect something? Maybe. the third, But the high prey line, clearly, you know, th- this was a setup. Yeah, let me call you in with all my buddies here, and uh, let's just see what's going on here. And, oh, yeah, let, here's a good chunk of money, and uh, you just go ahead and get on your way. I mean, so we got that, and then uh, we have... Kelsier, you know, who we were introduced in the prologue, uh, coming in and, you know, already getting this team of people. And we've got some, we've got a couple of things, a couple of things dropped. We got like Smoker, Misting, um, uh, Ten Eye. Yeah, Smoker and Ten Eye were the two. It's like, what, what even are, what the heck is a Smoker? What the heck is a Ten Eye? Um, well, and we, you know, we, we got the we got we've got the the we've got the book Mistborn in the store where the mists come out, and we have the misting. Yeah. You know, where miss miss something is going to be coming up around here a whole bunch. So, you know, we we we've got all these little things that are starting to be dangled in front of us. Sending out, by the way, you know, sending out the little like uh, cards that you send out from locations, misting you today. Misting. <laughs> 
I, I can always think of the 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 crim posting right already um and but yeah i think the big thing here right is like you know from chapter one to chapter two we are starting out with kelsier arriving in luthadel and obviously ducks and they seem to be the best of friends um it, it really played off that way they really at the very least at the very least like you can tell kelsier respects the hell out of Doxin because Doxin kind of tugs on him and plays around with them and you know someone that that at least at least in the ska uh in the skull circle here has already gotten a reputation as the survivor this guy obviously isn't daunted by that well and the other thing is is that if you look at Doxin I mean um we don't know much about him yet but we can infer a few things like when we come through here like we don't. It doesn't sound like he's a nobleman, um, so you might think that okay, he's probably a ska. But does he sound like any ska we've ever talked to, other than Kelsier, with that kind of confidence? No, he, he's yeah. With that kind of like you know, he's got something going on. You know, I mean, you could say Cayman's got like some level of maybe confidence. At least he's got you know he can talk with some sort of authority. But I mean, he's trying to scam noblemen and obligators. That's a you know. I think I mentioned at the very beginning of this episode, that's a very tall task when we were talking about like plantation ska. Right, right. And so he's got at least some level of something. I mean, he's he's in part of this thieving group. He's likely their leader. Um, and then, you know, you get someone like Dachshund who has at least Kelsier's respect. So, you know, he's got to have something going on. So it's almost like a, a chicken and the egg kind of thing. You have Kelsier who respects Dachshund. You have Dachshund who respects Kelsier. Both of these guys at least talk with some level of confidence, and we know at least Kelsier's got something going on. Yeah. Um, and not just that, but this something may be kind of new. Yeah, I mean, Dachshund, like, right off the bat, they don't say what it is, but he, he straight up mentions, you know, oh, yeah, that new thing about you. I'm going to have to get used to that. Indeed. And when I heard that, I was like, oh, man, you know, like like I was saying, who is Kelsier? He's he has this big reputation behind him. He's supposedly a ska, and he killed a whole like like you know a small army of guards and stuff. And a good, so a good group of people, yeah. So what is this then that he possibly has? They're mentioning mistings. They're mentioning smokers and ten eyes. Like obviously, there there there's some there are these titles given to individuals for extraordinary something that you know, points them out that makes them special so like what is kelser then what is he hey guys it's matt thanks for listening to the autos podcast you'll start seeing regularly scheduled episodes starting november 14 2022 if you'd like to follow us please consider subscribing we're a small project so please support us with likes and comments because that's what the algorithms crave if you're listening to the youtube channel please hit the notification bell and if you really want to give us a boost consider supporting us on patreon so we can give vaught a better mic 